So uh, listen, on your handout, uh, we are going to be going over this introduction to China. We've so far this semester talked about things like the Neolithic Revolution. We've gone through the transition from hunter gatherers to food producing to farmers. We've talked about early Mesopotamia. We read parts of the oldest book ever written, the Epic of Gilgamesh. We've looked at some of the oldest laws ever written, the Code of Hammurabi with the eye for eye philosophy. We've turned our attention to ancient India where they had a social stratification system where you experience a role based on what you deserve from a past life based on your karma. And we even saw some people weren't satisfied with that completely. And there was a guy who rejected some of the elements of the caste system who later became known as the Buddha, who said anyone, if they work hard, can experience what he described as nirvana. We also, in our time together, talked about the ancient Greeks and how one man, Alexander the Great, conquered an empire that spread his culture in a phenomenon we call Hellenization. We talked about how the Greeks got replaced by a yet bigger empire, the Romans, and how their Pax Romana spread their culture. And we also talked about a group of people who were the first to say that gods were not existent, but there was only one, and this god was definitely not anthrop anthropomorphic, this group, ethnic group of people were the Jews. the Jews. We also talked about one famous Jewish person, a carpenter who claimed to be a Messiah-like figure and ultimately was crucified in a new religion Christianity started. And we also talked about Islam, a man 600 years after Jesus who said that he was the final prophet and to actually, as evidence of the authenticity of that message, this early Muslim empire actually conquered the Persian Empire and like half of the Roman Empire. But even that strong Muslim empire would not stay united for long. Sadly, there was a civil war in the Muslim world, leaving the Muslim world split into two, the majority being what kind of Muslims? The Sunni and the minority with their devotion to Ali and Hussein, we call those Muslims the the Shias, or you could say Shiites, but Shia is probably the more common way. Well, today our attention is going to China, and it says on the handout for geography, it says that China has some natural boundaries that allow for, I want you to write down, independent development. I want you to write down that first line, independent development. What I mean by this is that China is kind of insulated by its boundaries. If you have a mental map of China, what is like the major ocean that's a border, a boundary of China with the rest of the world? The Pacific, that's like the world's largest ocean. And so, yeah, that's a natural boundary. If you also think about a neighbor that China has, they're actually right next door to India, but there's a mountain range separating India from China. Which ones? The Himalayas. And the thing about the Himalayas is that's the world's tallest mountain range. So though China is next to India, there are these barriers that give some distance between these two cultures. And so that's why we're writing down these natural boundaries allowed for independent development. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And the second thing about China that we should know is that almost all civilizations were all along river valleys. In fact, on the handout, what are the two rivers that dominated in China. Yellow and the Yangtze River, right? These were those famous rivers that made life possible. But the, the bummer about the Yellow River, even though it had so much good, you know, it offered fresh water and irrigation and transportation, the Yellow River has a nickname. It's actually in quotations on your handout. It's called China's what? Sorrow. Sorrow. And even though this Yellow River was essential for life, it also sadly, tragically, often had a tendency to do what, based on the handout? To flood. In fact, you'll write down where it says the Yellow River flood killed, we'll write down thousands of people. The thing about the Yellow River is that it would flood unpredictably, it would flood randomly, it would flood in devastating ways. And in fact, this flooding was so bad the Chinese tried to deal with it by building a series of something called levees. Levees are things designed to hold back the water to keep flooding from damaging cities and urban areas. There's a major U.S. city that has a whole network of levees. 
In fact, there's this major U.S. city that if you look at it geographically, the city itself actually is like a bowl. And that's bad because the major part of the city is below sea level. So when it rains or if it, it gets extensive uh, precipitation, the city's going to flood. So they have a series of pumps and a series of levees to hold out the water. And that usually works. But this city's levee system broke and the pumps failed in this famous hurricane that killed thousands. What city am I referring to? New Orleans. New Orleans. What hurricane was that? Katrina. And so Hurricane Katrina caused those levees to fail. And when those levees failed, whole neighborhoods were inundated and people flooded and people died. Well, the Yellow River similarly has this network of levees and it wasn't just like a one time failure that killed thousands. Actually on the handout, it says these levees were breached or broken. We'll write down how many times it happened. We're going to write down 1,500 times. Can you imagine there being not one Hurricane Katrina, but 1,500 examples of the levees breaking and as a result, urban areas flooding? In addition, it says on the handout that this river, the Yellow River, changed directions. We'll write down 14 times. When it floods so much, sometimes the river actually spills outside of its banks. And the river might spill outside of its banks. And during the flooding, the river could actually shift a little bit to the left or shift a bit to the right. And that's a problem because usually there's going to be a town or there's going to be a village built along the banks of the river. As a result, if this river floods, if this river shifts and this river moves, your village that used to be on the banks of the river, where is it now? In the river. Yeah, it's like under the water, right? So this is a big problem that we see. The levees have been breached. The rivers change directions. These are some challenges and why the Yellow River is called China's sorrow. Well, below that, there's a natural resource, a crop that is uh, the main leading one, rice. We've talked about this before. And there's another thing that is noteworthy about China is that China is home to the silkworm. And actually, it's the only place where the silkworm lives. And what we'll write down where it says silkworms, I want you to write down that China has a monopoly. I want you to write down that China has a monopoly. And I want to talk about that word monopoly because there's been a lack of certainty of what that word means. I'm not talking about the game that destroys families at 2 a.m. when I talk about the word monopoly. But if I say that a country has a monopoly on a product, what does that mean? They're the, only one that has it. They're the only ones who have it, right? And listen, if you're the only one that has a source, a resource, what can you do with the price of that thing? Yeah, right. And what are people going to do? They can't say, well, I'll just go to another. There's no other place. And it turns out that silk, this luxury fabric, because it's so soft and so delicate, and so nice. It, it comes from an insect. It comes from a worm. And there's only one place on the planet where this worm lived, and that was in China. And so it was so uh, connected with China that we actually there's a name. You probably know this for the route that goes from China to Europe because silk is what's moved on it. We call it the, the Silk Road, right? Like maybe you've heard of that, even if you don't know the details of it. So China has a monopoly, and these are some of the things that makes China noteworthy, a place that people want to go and do business, a place where people want to trade. Leaving geography, going to history, we know that the first dynasty, a dynasty, if you don't know, is like a family that rules father, son, father, son. The first dynasty that we have in China is which one? The Shang. And if you look at the Shang dynasty, I gave you the dates. What's the, the beginning date of that Shang dynasty? Yeah, BCE, which again means before whose birth? Jesus. So if Jesus was a sophomore in his high school, this history was 1,750 years before he was born. This was ancient history for Jesus, you know, like this was already in his AP world history class. 
China's been along for a long time, and that's really important, especially when you consider our country is about 200 something years old. <coughs> We're not very old. There's restaurants in Europe older than our country. China has us beat by like 4,000 years. It's an incredibly old culture. And it says on the handout, because they've been around for so long, China has developed an attitude and its perspective about the outside world. And there's a word below Shang Dynasty, it's the word barbarian. And we've talked about this word before. When we think of barbarian, we think of someone who's like wild or unkept or crazy or long hair or shirtless. That's what we think about when we often hear this word barbarian, but that's not what the Chinese thought about necessarily. And I want you to write down what the Chinese definition of a barbarian is. And again, for our purposes, in our mind, a barbarian is someone who's not educated, someone who's not sophisticated, someone who's not intelligent, perhaps. Well, what about the Chinese? For their definition, where it says barbarians, I want you to write down non-Chinese. I want you to write down, where says barbarian? I want you to write down non-Chinese. For a Chinese person, the definition of a barbarian is simple. It's, are you Chinese? If you're not Chinese, then you are a barbarian. That means the Romans and the Persians and the Muslims and, and any civilization, the Indians, all of these people, they might be somewhat smarter. Maybe the Romans are smarter than the Greeks or maybe the Indians way smarter than the Romans. But all of you are really just barbarians. You're just kind of social trash compared to China because China in their perspective are the best culture that's ever been on the surface of the world. There's a word for this term, this idea that you are the best. And it's a good word that you should be able to use in your vocabulary. It's the word, it says on your handout, ethnocentricity. And that's a big kid word that you should become familiar with. Ethnocentricity, it's, it's the view that one culture is superior to others. That's what ethnocentricity means. And many people would point out that the Chinese are guilty of that. The Chinese are guilty of viewing that their culture is better, it's the gold standard, and that everyone else is really just trash compared to the Chinese. And because of that, there's a word that China develops, a term that they use to describe themselves. If you look at how we describe ourselves, it kind of like tells you what we think about ourselves. Like, for example, we have a song that we sing before football games. What is that? The national anthem. Or even before other things like we have, even at our high school, like the, the choir will sing the national anthem. Um, there's a line in the national anthem. It says that, we are the home of the, uh, the land of the, and the home of the brave, like the land of the free, home of the brave, or whatever it is. That's like how we view ourselves, like we are free and we are brave, we're America. But for China, there was a different way that they viewed themselves, and still on this line that says uh, ethnocentricity, I want you to write down the term that they use to describe themselves. I, I put it on the board. They called themselves the Middle Kingdom. That was their nickname for themselves. And on that line that still says ethnocentricity, I want you to write down Middle Kingdom. That's what they called themselves. They thought that they were, compared to all other civilizations, compared to everything else on the planet, they thought they were the Middle Kingdom, that they were the most important thing that ever was. They thought, okay, Rome, you're kind of cute with your Colosseum and your roads and your act, like that's cool and all. Muslim world with your empire that you've created and everyone performs Hajj, that's like fine and all. But really, the best culture on planet Earth, the middle, the center of everything is China. We, the Chinese said, we are the middle kingdom. That was their perspective, that was their point of view. Below that, this middle kingdom had a king, had an emperor, and it tells us on our handout that they thought that the role of the king, it says, they thought the role of the king was indispensable. Now, if I had a football team and I had a starter and this starter was like my entire offense, he could like run the ball, he could throw the ball, uh, he could do all these things. If I, And every time we don't play this kid, we lose. If I said, man, that player is indispensable, what does that mean about this kid? He's, he's, the, 
I can't get rid of him. I actually need this player. He's indispensable. And the Chinese thought that their ruler, the king, this role of having a king was indispensable, that we need to have someone in charge of us. And they said that actually the king was the indispensable intermediary, we'll write down, between the physical and the spiritual world. So on your handout where it says indispensable, we can't get rid of this guy or the role of this guy, he was the intermediary. He was the middleman between the physical world and the spiritual world. We need this guy, the king. And they really believed there was a spiritual world. There was a, a world beyond what we see with our hands or what we can touch. In fact, the thing is that death doesn't really end your story. They believe that it'd be important in, in our life right now, in our culture right now, the Chinese would say, you have people in your family, you have fathers and mothers and you have grandparents. And you know what? You should talk to them. You should get advice from your grandpa. You should get advice from your grandma. You should have a relationship with them. But they would go farther and say, just because your grandpa dies doesn't mean you stop respecting your grandpa. Just because your grandmother dies doesn't mean you stop asking grandma for advice. But there's a problem because grandma's dead. So how do I talk to a dead grandmother? How do I communicate with my dead great grandfather if he's dead and he's in the grave? Well, the Chinese say that there's ways around death as a barrier. And that gets us to our new section called ancestor worship. This is communicating with, we'll write down, dead loved ones. This is communicating with dead loved ones, that it is your responsibility that if there's someone in your life who's passed on, your grandfather, your grand grandmother, you need to continue to communicate and actually you need to worship your grandma or your grandpa and ask them for advice. It says on the handout that this process of communicating with the dead is called divination. This is the ability to communicate with the dead. We need to consult we'll write down our dead loved ones. We need to consult our dead loved ones. In fact, if you don't ask your dead grandma for advice, she could get mad at you and she could actually like haunt you from beyond the grave. If you don't consult your dead grandfather, if you don't honor your dead grandpa, he could also mess with you from beyond the grave. So we need a way to figure out what does grandpa think? What does grandma believe? How is she talking to me? Well, this is where the word divination comes from. It's this communicating with the dead. Now, in the United States, we have ways we do this. For example, if you went to Target and you went to like the board game section of Target, you're going to find Sorry and Connect Four and Shoots and Ladders. But you can also find in the board game section of Target a game where you can communicate with the dead. Ouija board, right? Go ahead. Okay, so there's actually in America multiple ways to communicate with the dead. If you don't want to buy the Ouija board, you don't have to. Now, if you've ever played with one, how does a how does a Ouija board work? What's the the process? And it looks like we have a local expert. Tell us about how it works. From and who's responding? A, a spirit, apparently. A spirit in the room, right? And then afterwards, you say goodbye. What if you don't? What if you forget to say goodbye? And what if you just, like put the they game? They so if you don't play this game right, you get haunted. You know, you're just you know, it's just you're just looking for some fun. It's two a.m. You and your friends at the sleepover. Next thing you know, if you don't say goodbye, you get. Someone told me you're supposed to like burn the board if things go wrong. I've heard a lot of different, it's just kind of like when you play Uno and you go to your friend's house, you're like, we don't play Uno that way. And there's like the double reverse rule and you're like, well, we can't even get agree. I've heard the, so many rules for Ouija board that the, the rules get conflicting. So I'm just saying we in the United States, we also have a practice of divination where you can communicate with the dead or 
communicate with spirit. But you said there's other ways. What what's the other way that you said? Okay, so multiple. If you're not into like the game, you have options. And I've never even heard of a spirit rod, but that's a thing. Well, in China, they have various ways to communicate with the dead as well. And one of the ways it says on the handout is something called oracle bones. So can you imagine if you had like a turtle or a tortoise? And imagine this turtle or this tortoise, it died, right? Um, the flesh would like deteriorate, you know, that would like eat away, but the shell would remain because it's it's a shell. So what they would do is they would take that shell and they would write a question on that shell. Should I take this job? Should I give this guy a second chance? Should I leave my spouse? And after you wrote the question on the shell, they would put that shell into a fire and the fire would heat up, heat up, heat up. The shell would eventually crack. And then now you have this cracked shell. You would look at that shell and look at the cracks and you would interpret those cracks as like coded messages from grandma. You look at that crack and say, oh, grandma definitely thinks I should leave that person. Grandpa definitely would say, take that job. All those different variations are messages from beyond the grave. We also do something kind of like that in our culture where you can pay a stranger to look at lines to tell you what it means about your future. What do you get read? What, what is that? Um, basically, runs in the hands of the person. Picture love life, uh, occupation, um, luck, all that kind of stuff. All, all that. Happens and tea leaves also. So like in America, we actually do the, we're talking about a culture. 4,000 years ago, they did this. And now we are in an age of internet, vaccines, physics and we still do the same thing in the united states you'll pay a woman you've never met a man you've never met to look at the lines on your hands and tell you about your relationships about your love and all these things and people do that right or you talked about tea leaves tell me i've heard a lot about this today tell me about tea leaves how could tea leaves tell me if my marriage is going to work out how does that work um actually you drink the tea you ask, you ask a question before interpret what the what tea leaves are forming. So like for example, if there's a heart, their love life is good. Or if there's like a bird, that means like a family member's gonna die or something like that. From my tea? Yeah. That's not good. I don't know what to think. There's like I think there's a I think there's one of those places like right next to that snow cone place across from Family Dollar. So you can go Family Dollar, snow cone, and get your future determined like in one shot without leaving Laporte City limits? That's like a good deal. And people say there's nothing to do with Laporte, but like you gave me like the trinity of a good time. So we do the same thing here in our culture. And that's what they did with oracle bones, but not just oracle bones. In other cultures, it says in Mesopotamia, they would get intestines. Intestines are like your guts. They would kill like a chicken or an animal and they'd take the guts and they'd throw it on the ground. And based on the shape it made, like, oh, I definitely should not give that guy another chance. I definitely should leave that woman. They're interpreting, just like she said that they're looking at how leaves look oh that's my future these are different ways people try to communicate with the dead this is called divination so there's multiple ways to do it we'll write down it says uh turtle shells in china intestines in mesopotamia to hear from the dead to hear from the spirits we're trying to communicate with the dead trying to communicate with the spirits so china is a pretty spiritual place and not only are they a spiritual place, but they also believe that there's something that happens to you after you die. It says on the handout that when we look at what people get buried with, it kind of gives us a snapshot to what they think happens next when you die. For example, there is a famous leader named Fu Hao. And when we look at like what he was buried with, that kind of like shows what they think is important. 
It says that this one leader, he was buried with some things that maybe you and I think, ah, not so impressive, not a big deal. He was buried with 7,000 shells, 1,600 manufactured objects, 440 pieces of bronze, 750 pieces of jade, 560 bone carvings. He was buried with ivory, with pottery. Please write down 16 humans. These are things that he was buried with that were put in the ground with him. What's odd about the last thing I told you? Why is that weird? Why not? I mean, I think, uh, I think not. I think not. And so typically, this happened with Pharaoh also. Uh, if Pharaoh and Egypt had servants, they're like, man, this guy's so good. He's so reliable. Um, when I die, I'm going to need someone who's good and reliable by my side. So FYI, when I die, make sure you kill my secretary. He's going in the ground with me. And so this meant that they kind of believed that the things you have in this world you would take with you to the next world as well. I'm gonna take my jade, I'm gonna take my ivory, and I'm taking the secretary with me. 16 humans were buried with this guy. On the handout below that, uh, it says writing. So China has a form of writing, almost pretty much every civilization does. And it says that they use what's called pictograms, that this is similar to cuneiform, but it's unlike cuneiform because it's actually still used in China today. For us, we don't have pictograms. We have an alphabetic system. And how many letters are in our alphabet? Well, I heard various numbers. <laughs> 26, I think. And I think pretty much if you memorize those ABCs, there's even a song if you don't know it, if you memorize those ABCs, you can almost spell any word or actually get roughly in the ballpark of spelling any word. Sometimes the, the double Bs or double Ls trip us up or the PH sound. Why does that make an F? That doesn't make any sense at all. So you can get in the ballpark. But in Chinese, every word has its own character. So if you are going to learn to read and write, you have to memorize thousands of characters, not the 26, and then like make the combinations based on sound. You have to memorize thousands of characters. That's a lot of work. It says on the handout, memorization and literacy, this is very time consuming. Actually, it takes a lot of time to be able to do this. So as a result, only the upper class can meaningfully engage in this. This is not new. We've talked about since the beginning that reading and writing is something only the upper class could do and even more so in China, because I need to be able with skill and, and quality, write these symbols and be able to read them. And that kind of just reinforces what I've told all of you before that you guys, the fact that you can read and write, that makes all of you in this room like the top 2% of all of human history. If you're a girl in this room, that makes you like the top 0.1%, because 100 years ago, 500 years ago, if I could educate one, my son or my daughter, who am I going to educate? My son. And so the girls in this room, you represent like the 0.1% top of all of human history because they didn't allow girls to be educated. If anyone was going to be, it'd be the boy, but not even then. So the girls here as a percent are some of the best educated of any who have ever lived on planet Earth. It says on the handout, that there's just no time for the farmer to memorize symbol. There's really just more pressing issues. I've got rice in the field. I've got work to be done. I don't have time for my son staring at symbols on a piece of paper. Below that, mandate of heaven. So the mandate of heaven on that title, I want you to write down what this means and we'll kind of explain what this means. I want you to write down right where it says mandate of heaven directly to the right. I want you to write down the permission to rule China, permission to rule China. Let's imagine that Becca asked to go to the nurse. So I write her name on a pass and I give Becca permission to to use that. 
And she walks down the hall, but instead of going to the nurse, she decides to go to CTE. And after CTE, she decides to go to the theater. And after CTE in the theater, she decides to go to uh, to the to the uh, to the pool, you know. And she's got this pass or whatever. Well, that pass was like designed for one thing, and she's not really she's not really using the pass appropriately anymore. And she got caught by a principal. The principal was where she supposed to be, and she's like out in the junior parking lot and she says i've got a pass though is she going to keep that pass in her hand or the principal can say oh, okay that's fine you, you you can keep that pass is that is that going to be okay you're saying yes the answer is no <laughs> the answer is no right like if she stopped and someone takes 30 seconds to evaluate where she's supposed to be the pass is going to be taken away from her and the thing is that the chinese believe that in a sense the gods in heaven have given a permission slip, not a physical piece of paper, but they have given permission for a man to rule China. And the thing is that this, this permission to rule China is called the mandate of heaven. If I was the emperor of China and you were to ask me, why should you listen to me? I would say, well, that's easy. The gods chose me to be your leader. I have the mandate of heaven. But just because I have the mandate of heaven today, just because the gods are like supporting me today, doesn't mean that they'll support me tomorrow. It turns out I could actually lose the mandate of heaven. I could lose the permission the gods have given me to rule China. And now it's up to you and me, normal Chinese people, to figure out who has the mandate and who doesn't have the mandate. And it's actually quite simple to kind of figure that out for the most part. Couple terms to sort out though. It says on the handout, the word heaven, this is not a place, but it says heaven is the name for their supreme deity. What does that word deity mean? D-E-I-T-Y. What does that word mean? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Say what you said again. Oh, it, yeah. So it means God. So like sometimes you see the word deity or deities. If you don't know, that word means a higher power, or very simply, it means the word God. So for Chinese thinking, heaven is not a place. It's 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 the name of their God called heaven. And there's someone on your handout who is the son of heaven. We'll write down that's the emperor. The emperor is the son of heaven, and that's cool. And if I am the son of heaven, if I'm the emperor, I have the right to rule China. I have the mandate of heaven. But what can happen to me, even if I'm the emperor, what does it say on my handout? What can happen to me? I can lose that status. I am today the emperor. I am today the son of heaven. I today have the permission slip, the mandate of heaven, but I'm not guaranteed always to have that. I could lose it. And how would I lose the mandate of heaven? Well, it says on the handout, there's two types of rulers, those who rule rightly and those who rule wrongly. Let's imagine that Dallas was the emperor. And let's imagine that actually Dallas, you know, we're all kind of surprised. We're like, Dallas, really? That guy? I mean, he's that kid. And I, I have six period with Dallas. And let's say Dallas rules and actually things are going quite well. Uh, there's plenty of jobs and and uh, there's, you know, in summer, it wasn't like scorching hot this summer, which is like weird. And and winter, it wasn't like freezing. And that was like awesome. And the borders, well, the borders have like never been more secure. Like I wasn't afraid of like invasion or I wasn't afraid of war. And if that's how it was while Dallas was ruling, we would assume that the gods in heaven were kind of giving Dallas like a thumbs up. They were saying, yeah, Dallas was doing a good job. And so what we're going to do on your handout where it says right rule, we'll write down China has blessings. Where it says right rule, I want you to write down that China has blessings on your handout. So that's one way I know that Dallas is someone I should follow. I should listen to him because he has the mandate of heaven. And if you were to ask, ask me, how do I know? I'll say, just look around. You know, we got jobs, we are safe, things are going great. But let's say that, I don't know, let's say that uh, let's say that Noah took over next. Now, Noah takes over next, and at first things are going fine, but next thing you know, there's like a weird like disease that like breaks out, and, and people are getting sick, and people are dying. We're like, okay, well, that's weird, but you know, these things happen. We'll just press on. 
But then let's say Noah is ruling and Noah is the king. He is the emperor. He's the son of heaven. And not only is there a sickness that breaks up, but let's say people are invading our borders. There's enemies who've, who've grown bold and, and now they're crossing into our territory, taking our resources. And let's say also during Noah's rule, there's, there's earthquakes. And let's say during Noah's rule, what might the Yellow River do? Let's say the Yellow River had a flood and thousands of people died. Let's say that there was a typhoon that hit. Let's say that jobs were not there anymore. If all these things were happening, what would we, the people of China, assume the gods had decided about Noah and him holding the mandate of heaven? It's not good. And that he had actually lost the mandate of heaven. This word mandate of heaven means like this permission, not like a physical permission, but, but the symbolic permission the gods gave him to rule. Wrong rule. If heaven is not satisfied with your rule, what can we see? We could see floods. We could see earthquakes. We could see invasion. Where it says on your handout, wrong rule, heaven is not satisfied. So what are the so's? We could see earthquakes. We could see floods. We could see disease. These are all things that tell me I might want to think about rebelling against Noah. Because I don't know if Noah has the mandate of heaven anymore. I don't know if he has the permission slip to rule. Let's say we get rid of Noah and then we get we get um, Aiden. And things are like great at first with Aiden. You know, at first, you know, things couldn't be better under Aiden. Um, the disease goes away. Under Aiden, uh, the barbarians at the gates get kicked out. Under Aiden, jobs are restored. And things are great under Aiden for a while. But then Aiden gets like complacent and Aiden stops like repairing the bridges and the roads. And he doesn't actually, he figures out he can save money not training the military and taking that money and lining his pocket. And Aiden started off great, but slowly Aiden grows corrupt. He starts being ineffective. People start not liking him and then they rebel against Aiden. And now we put David in charge. And when David rules, he's the new guy. Everyone's super excited. He does everything better that we didn't like about Aiden. But you know what happens over time with David? David gets lazy. He grows corrupt. He takes bribes. Things fall apart. And we have a revolution. And guess what? We pick Landon to take over next. And, and Landon starts off like really great. And he does all the things right that David didn't do. Things are awesome. But then even Landon, he grows corrupt and he doesn't do a great job and things fall apart. And guess what? We kick out Landon. Then we put Amy in charge and things are like infinitely better under Amy. And she's great and she's awesome. But then same thing. It's this cycle. In fact, that's why on your handout, we call this the dynastic cycle. It's a cycle of replacement of corruption and replacement again. In our own country, what? how do we see that cycle in our own politics, our own country? Right. Every election, right? Like go back to like, go back to uh, the 1990s, we had a guy, Bill Clinton, who was president, or oh, go back to the 80s, uh, or let's go back to the 70s. <laughs> in the 70s, we had a president, Jimmy Carter, he was a Democrat. And Jimmy Carter uh, lost to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was president twice. He was a Republican. And he was so well loved by Republicans that Ronald Reagan's vice president, a guy named George H.W. Bush, another Republican, got elected. But after 12 years of Republicans, America's like, yeah, we're done with Republicans. And they voted for this Democrat who won twice, who came after no, no, no. We're rushing ahead. We have Jimmy Carter, Democrat, eight years of Reagan, Republican, four years of George H.W. Bush, and then eight years of this guy, Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat. And after eight years of Democrats, people were like, gosh, I'm all I'm maxed out on the Democrats. And we got George W. Bush, which is weird. We had a father and a son in a short amount of time. George W. Bush, who was 
a Republican. We had him for eight years. And after eight years, people were like, gosh, I'm maxed out on Republicans. We need someone young. We need someone fresh. We need someone charismatic. Who did we vote after Bush? Sure. This just happened in your in Obama. Obama. Obama, a Democrat, was president for eight years. And after eight years of Democrats, people said, yeah, I'm kind of tired of the Democrat thing. We're voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump. Somehow Donald Trump got elected. You know, he was a reality TV. Show. He had a show called Celebrity Apprentice. You know, like that guy, right? And then after four years of Donald Trump, we're like, oh, well, we're tired of this. And we got Joe Biden. Uh, now, Joe uh, Biden, Joe, Joe Biden, in his first few uh, months as president, when we did polls, he was polling pretty high, like 56% of Americans thought he's doing a pretty good job, 56%. Okay. Last yeah. week, his poll numbers are at 39%. Good job. And so, you know, some things have happened. You know, there was the whole yeah. Afghanistan yeah. thing that happened. There has been coronavirus. Actually, more people had coronavirus in the last three months than last year when we went in lockdown. I'm not saying that that's his fault. I'm just saying that that hasn't been resolved. So at some point, either Joe's going to bounce back or we're going to vote for a Republican, a Republican. We have this cycle in our own culture today. Um, we've got three minutes, we'll finish this side. There is uh, now three philosophies that we're going to talk about. And the first philosophy, we have three minutes, I'm going to use my three, is called legalism. And legalism it is a belief that human nature, we'll write down, is basically evil. Legalism is a Chinese philosophy that says, we as humans are basically evil. And they'll say, I can prove that to you because when James was a one or two year old and he took a cookie or took some candy that wasn't his and his mom said, do you have a cookie or do you have candy? No. James will say no as he's holding it in his hand. No one had to teach James, hey son, just want to let you know, this is how you lie. It's real helpful when you're older to get up. All by himself, James knew how to lie. What he had to be taught was to be truthful. He had to be taught to share. He had to be taught not to like, hit his friends with a truck or whatever James did growing up. He, legalism says human nature is that you and I are basically evil. And the role of laws, it says humans are so evil, we need strict laws to force us to become good. We need strict laws to force us to be good. How will strict laws force us to be good? We're going to look at that a little bit more tomorrow. There's going to be some homework this evening. Please go 